The path to the Democratic Party's annual convention is beginning to look like 1968. In 1968, the goons of the then liberal president of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson, at the height of the bloodbath, he had intensified exponentially in Vietnam and in Cambodia. The goons of his goon, the mayor of Chicago, Richard Daly Sr., clubbed and gassed hundreds of thousands of anti-Vietnam War demonstrators, clubbed them senseless into the ground. The people on the protest sang, the whole world is watching. They weren't actually, not in 1968, that depended upon, well, friendly owners of giant media corporations who were few and far between back then. But the whole world is definitely watching what's happening now in the run-up to Joe Biden's coronation as the Democratic Party's presidential candidate for the elections in November. Because now, as opposed to then, the whole world can watch, is watching. And what a sight it is. Elderly professors, women, lady, philosophers, people who are eminent in their academic field and advanced in their years are being brutally assaulted by uniformed thugs on behalf of principals of universities acting on the orders usually of Democratic Party governors and politicians. It is truly an unedifying sight. And it reads like a who's who of my guests. One of my guests tonight was arrested over the weekend. He's mercifully free. We'll soon see if he was clubbed. We'll see if he has been injured. And 73-year-old Dr. Jill Stein, a Jewish woman, a friend of mine, a guest of mine, Dr. Jill Stein standing to be president of the United States of America, was severely assaulted by thugs who rammed a bicycle into her before carting her and her campaign manager and her deputy campaign manager off to the jail. It's all being done to protect a man who is about to be the subject of an international arrest warrant for crimes against humanity, for crimes that border at least plausibly on genocide, according to the International Criminal Court. It is truly astonishing that the media continues to support a man about to be issued with an arrest warrant for war crimes, crimes against humanity. Not that you would know it from reading the British media, and I don't suppose the American media is any different. Lie after lie after lie after lie paves every day their coverage, not just of the genocide, but of the worldwide protests against it. Lies about the numbers who are there. That's where they report it at all. Lies like the Mail on Sunday today, showing two Holocaust memorials covered up by tarpaulin, that the Mail on Sunday lied, lied and lied, were covered up by the police because they might have been desecrated, forcing the Metropolitan Police into a very rare rebuke of Britain's biggest national newspaper, who said that covering these monuments up had absolutely nothing to do with them. They were covered up as they are often covered up in demonstrations and other events in case any harm might have befallen them. At a stroke, killing the idea that the hundreds of thousands of peaceful, democratic, anti-war protesters would somehow have 
stooped to desecrate a monument to a massacre of millions of people, six million of them Jewish people. You see what they were trying to do there. They were trying to fix in the readership's mind the idea that the protesters hate Jews, that the protesters love what happened in the Holocaust. They're trying to fix in the mind of the public that the protesters are violent, are vandals, when nobody has been arrested on these demonstrations from amongst the mass of millions of people for anything more uh, than minor litter offenses. It is a big, giant lie. But it is a lie that is being pumped out by bought and paid for American politicians and British politicians who continue to refer to these protests as hate marchers and the marchers as hate marchers, when in fact their only demand, to my consternation because it's not my only demand, their only demand is for a ceasefire in a conflict which has slaughtered and maimed well over 120,000 people, including historically significant massacres of doctors and patients still in their medical scrubs, still in their pajamas from their hospital beds, found with their hands tied behind their backs and executed at close quarters in a grotesque war crime, a grotesque crime against humanity. And it's continuing until this very day. These protesters at Harvard and Yale and NYU and Browns and hundreds of universities and colleges all over the United States is, of course, comparable to the great mass movement that arose in America when there were far fewer pictures and far less footage available to them of the great crime that the United States was then carrying out itself. They have every right under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution to protest and speak freely against an action with which they profoundly disagree, but they are being brutalized and arrested for the simple act of sitting down, for the simple act of putting up a tent in which they intend to sleep and to bear witness to what they consider to be a major crime, a crime which the ICJ has already said is plausibly the crime of genocide itself the highest crime in the human legal canon. It is extraordinary how Western public is being attuned to the destruction of the very freedoms that we were told were what marked us out from dictatorships and authoritarian regimes. And I don't just refer to the brutalization of elderly female university professors, of 73-year-old Dr. Jill Stein, herself Jewish. I don't just refer to that. Elon Musk has finally turned openly, publicly, in support of Israel and is now presiding over a witch hunt and large-scale suppression of alternative points of view on his platform, Twitter, which he told us had been returned to the free speech camp. Sure, you can have free speech on many things on Twitter, but not on Israel-Palestine. <coughs> it is extraordinary, isn't it, that Elon Musk, who once prided himself on having a neutral view on great international conflicts, has become a paid-up member of the Israel lobby, a paid-up member of the Zionist lobby. 
he coined it. One thing, you know, if he'd, if he'd said it's because of the advertising blacklist that I have suffered, that I can no longer speak my mind freely, if he'd said this is driven by commercial uh, extremities, it is uh, forced upon me, I have to algorithmically crack down on videos of war crimes that are or were previously proliferated. If he said what is undoubtedly the truth, well, that would be one thing. But in the words of Bob Dylan, in the epic story of poor Hattie Carroll, you who philosophize disgrace, that's what Musk is doing today. He's philosophizing disgrace. He says that the idea that the weaker party in a conflict automatically deserves public sympathy and the stronger party in a conflict, which in this case means Israel, is somehow guilty of the crimes of which it is accused, is a philosophical misnomer. In that case, Mr. Musk support a ceasefire. If there's any ambiguity about who's right and who's wrong, at least support the demand to stop killing people whilst you philosophize and work out who's right and who is wrong. But he is cracking down on those who are seeking a ceasefire. There's so much going on, it's very difficult to know where to go next. But I'm going to go to my own country. It is reported today that little Rishi Sunak, the here today, California tomorrow, spring-heeled, elevator-heeled prime minister, unelected prime minister of Britain, is going to make it illegal for any legal process in Britain to be begun in the British courts concerning Britain's role in supporting Israel. I have it on good authority, and I'm going to be asking about it in the House of Commons this week, although I will get no satisfactory answer, that Israeli bombers are calling in at our airbase in Cyprus. I want to know what they're calling in for. Is it a cup of coffee and a cigarette, or is it to load new bombs with which they kill? innocent captives in their open-air prison, as David Cameron once called it, the Gaza Strip, to you. I want to know just how deeply Britain is involved in the killing fields of the Gaza Strip. But I fear that I will get no answer, even as an elected member of Parliament, because written parliamentary questions have elicited no answer as to what British Royal Air Force jets are doing flying over the Gaza Strip. Are they identifying targets? Are they collecting intelligence that they're handing over to a government whose head is about to be charged by the International Criminal Court with war crimes, with crimes against humanity? Is that what our brave airmen are being used for, I want to know. Why Britain is continuing to send arms and military components to a killing machine that has already been found plausibly guilty of genocide and may now be about to receive arrest warrants from the ICC. I want to know just exactly what my tax money is being used for, and many other people in Britain too. Not least the millions who are protesting every single weekend for more than six months against the atrocities that they can see, whether Elon Musk likes it or not. At least until what happened to TikTok in America happens to TikTok elsewhere, happens to every social media platform elsewhere, then you'll have to come to my website, georgegalloway.com, to see it. But I will not be silenced. 
and I will continue both here on the mother of all talk shows and on my additional show, Have It Out with Galloway, I will continue to highlight these crimes and Britain's role within it. Some people ask me, why are you so occupied by the Palestine question? I answer thus. The situation in Gaza right now is the moral center of the world. There is no room for hiding in this question. You are either with the mass murder or you are against it. You may not be in favor of the ruling party in the Gaza Strip. I wouldn't vote for them myself. You may not even necessarily support Palestinian statehood or the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people, although I wholeheartedly do myself. But if you are continuing to support what has become a murder spree unprecedented since the Second World War, unprecedented in this sense, that the people being murdered are in a cage from which they cannot escape, unprecedented in that the vast majority, more than 70%, of those being murdered are women and children. Women and children. Unprecedented in the sense that the Western countries, these beacons of freedom and democracy and human rights who are never done lecturing other parts of the world on these three things that identify us as opposed to them unprecedented in the sense that a gangster government has turned off the water, turned off the electricity, turned off the aid, except a tiny trickle of enough flour to make enough bread for the people to stay alive long enough to be murdered from the air. Unprecedented murder spree. You're either with it or you're against it. And what you decide will determine your fate on the judgment day, if there is one, as I believe there is, but will determine how you are seen by history. And if you're a politician, or if you're a hireling, lickspittle, so-called journalist, spewing out the lies of the Israel murder machine, your reputation will be judged on what you have done and are doing over this last six months. I promise you that. We will hunt you for the rest of your professional lives. Our children will hunt you for the rest of your professional lives. And when you're gone, what history will say about you is what you did, said, and didn't do or say while this murder spree was going on. The British political class and the American political class are already damned. Government and so-called opposition. Anyone who votes for either of them. Next Thursday, or whenever the general election comes, whenever the presidential election comes, anyone who votes for those responsible for this murder spree will have a lot of blood on their hands. Fasten your seatbelts. This is the mother of all talk shows.